continuing on with our history of drones here. Um, we went over last time introductions to sort of drones very broadly writ. We talked about um, our uh, sort of initial background. I want to finish that up today and, and lead into some of the units that we use, uh, that you guys will be using um, this semester. So this was, uh, this thing here was a uh, present to us and it was inter uh, yeah, sorry here. And so this was um, uh, important because it actually mirrors a lot of the history of this drone technology broadly written far, as far as the industry. So this is, um, we got two of these things. This thing was about five, four or five feet wide, the wingspan, um, rigid, hard plastic. Um, and essentially the Navy gave us these. So these were um, some uh, prototype drones from uh, the, basically the 90s. And uh, they said, do you want these? And I said, sure. And then it took a while because they had to remove. So they, they, they gave us these with some middle parts removed. That was like the secure, like DOD communication technology. So they didn't want to give us that. They just wanted to give us the, the mechanics and the sort of flight control stuff. So we got that. It ended up being a huge, so it was really, and that, that really started to spur us. So these guys said, hey, we want to give you this drone. And then we, I said, sure. And then campus was like, whoa, 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 you know, I don't know. And, and so it led us down a whole conversation of trying to figure out how we might do more stuff with this and how might this stuff help for, uh, for um, monitoring, training, education, all that kind of stuff. It also kicked up uh, an important conversation on campus, which was, um, mostly from the non-science community, but they're saying things like, what Department of Defense? Like, we don't want to be involved with the Department of Defense, right? Because they do war, and we don't want to be having anything about war. Which, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's important to have these conversations and, and talk about these things. Um, uh, I'm happy to, to, you know, discuss these things with you all, and you should think about them. Um, but I would suggest that um, much of the technologies that we use on a daily basis were derived from originally Department of Defense stuff. So compact disks, our data storage um, uh, technologies and computers, um, our, a lot of our, our sensors, all these things um, uh, came from spending. And that's because in this time in our society, um, much of the investment in basic research and innovation is coming from the government and they have various things they're interested in with various political uh, you know, whims and, and interests and this and that. And, and the Department of Defense is something that has funded a lot of things that have come to be GPS and all these things. So, um, so while I think we in ESRM generally are, are, would not be interested in doing anything with weapons or any kind of offensive, anything like that, um, there, there are technologies that we can benefit from, I would argue. And so, so this, we had, long story short, we had a long conversation on campus and eventually we decided, yes, if this stuff is not about blowing things up or, or that type of stuff, maybe we could, um, could use these things. Stepping back a little bit farther in terms of the history of this technology more broadly writ, um, uh, we could go back really, really far and, and talk about various things. One of the first um, important things here is, is this thing called the Mechanical Turk. Has anybody heard of the Mechanical Turk before? Nobody? Okay, so it was this, it was this um, uh, cabinet type thing, and apparently there was, there was a few different iterations of this, but, but the term has come to be uh, now a generic term. But that, the original thing was, um, you know, several hundred years ago, these guys would wheel in a, a cabinet-like uh, thing that had a chessboard on it. And, um, and some type of, uh, some type of um, uh, uh, robot looking thing, right? Like, like a, a marionette type of deal, right? And you would go up and you'd, you'd play chess with this thing. Like you, 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 the human, or the, usually it was like the king, would come up and, and he would move a pawn. And then, you know, it'd be quiet for a second. And then this marionette would kind of chick, 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 you know, pick up another pawn and move. And so it looked for all um, intents and purposes 
as if it was a robot and, as if, and also it would it'd play chess really well, right? Sometimes it would win, or <laughs> at least it was, it was definitely not just a random move piece A, B or somewhere. So it was really crazy. It turns out um, it was not the, it, and it fooled many, many people across Europe and, and the Ottoman Empire and all these places. Um, turns out what it was, was a super short dude, a little small dude inside working. Um, I mean, still an amazing piece of technology to make it, you know, to be able to sort of work a puppet like that. But the point is, um, it fooled a lot of people. And this technology at first appeared as if it was way, way smarter than it is, just like AI, right? Just like a lot of these other technologies we're dealing with. We first look at them and they seem magical, like, oh my God, it's incredible, it's doing this and that. And, and in fact, it might be something much simpler. And that's how a lot of our initial drone stuff uh, was. So we can um, trace back flying uh, autonomous vehicles to the early days of uh, airplanes. And, um, and uh, you know, if you were to see one of these things fly in the air, you're like, oh my God, it's like, it's, you know, a robot or something like that. We'd, we wouldn't have the, didn't have the term robot then, but, but oh my God, it's, it's, a, it's a living thing or something, right? It's some kind of uh, consciousness controlling it. Um, and even from the early days, uh, it was always someone like the Mechanical Turk. It was always someone that had control remotely, was puppeteering this stuff. Um, and so, so this is an example from the very first uh, 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 airplane that you sort of drove and then it would fly itself very stupidly, not, not you know, kind of in a straight path kind of thing. And there's a few other deals. Then really it's, it's the world wars that really start to advance um, this type of technology. And so a lot of this uh, it has roots in the U.S. And, um, and people trying to essentially have more accurate slaughtering of other people, right? So, so more accurate guiding of bombs and things of that nature. Um, and, things, and things progress and progress. Um, we have, and it, they get, start to get fairly sophisticated during World War II where um, the Germans in particular that were really making these um, uh, flying bombs, basically, um, the, the V1, V2, these things they were, that they were shooting off, and they were not particularly accurate. So, so we hear about the bombing of, of London and things of that nature from German-occupied France and, and, and from Germany and stuff. Those are really terror weapons. They, were not, they weren't like, hey, let's go blow up the military headquarters. They weren't that accurate. So there was a strong interest in figuring out how they could add more control, how this thing flying through the air could be more um, either, either itself control or really more at that time, more under human control. So can we use radio waves to make it go to the right, go to the left, that type of deal. And um, it, uh, what they lacked really at the time was sensing, it was information back from the thing, right? So they were making some progress into make it go to the right, make it go to the left, but they didn't know if they were going too far right or too far left type of deal. Um, Things next start to get really sophisticated in the 1950s, and the technology really, uh, the epicenter moves back to the U.S. And these are some of these examples of, again, just sort of flying bombs, but now they're getting much more um, effective, and we're starting to use these in different types of training. So rather than just blowing things up, some of these are starting to become um, uh, 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 useful in other applications. Um, and this is uh, an example of, of one of these guys in um, Vietnam. And in this case, this was meant to be a decoy. So this was not meant to blow anybody up. This was meant to flow this, fly this thing around and then have the opposition shoot at it, thinking it's an airplane. And so that meant we had to have more real control. It couldn't just fly randomly, right? So it had to have um, um, some amount of stability and all that kind of stuff. And we started advancing. Note that pretty much up to this point, what we're seeing is relatively large vehicles, right? And so there's a relative large amount of area you can put things on. You could put a big receiver or a big um, uh, uh, antenna or something like that on these things. Okay, uh, the next big advancement comes in the 80s and then is um, manifest in the 90s with um, General Atomics, which uh, really creates the blueprint for what we would now consider the modern military drone. And this is very sophisticated. These, these are now, whereas 
what we'll talk about in a bit is, is making all this technology smaller, smaller, smaller. It, these guys really say, oh, to do all this stuff we want to do, um, we can't do it small. So let's make it bigger. So they started making these things larger and larger and larger to the point where some of these larger vehicles are the size of, of, an air, of a you know, human carrying airplane with you know, 18 passengers potentially, you know, that, that, that type of size, size vehicle. And so um, they get that going on. Um, there's lots of economy. So even, even though they're making these big, uh, big platforms, most of the space is going to sensors and things like that. They're not, they're not putting a thousand million bombs on this. It's mostly an intelligence gathering thing. So we're seeing a shift from this as a weapon or as a, as a thing from just something to go blow up to something that is more about uh, understanding the world or, or providing information. And so the big payload here is, I mean, things are variable and they can change things around, but, but, but the, the big story here is all of the sensor packages in the communication packages. So now um, these guys have these incredibly sophisticated um, uh, you know, high resolution cameras and thermal imaging and all this kind of stuff and really secure communication that can go, um, uh, that goes around the world. So people can control this on one side of the globe in a comfortable air conditioned room while the, the platform is, you know, far, far away and have almost near instantaneous control of what's going on. Um, okay. And, th and this really, the public really first hears about this in the first Gulf War. So the first Gulf War, these are rolled out and they prove to be very, very um, uh, helpful and people start to see them and that's really what starts the, the public awareness. Okay. That pretty much stays the same. General Atomics is, is, is you know, and, and similar companies um, are, are advancing things. And then the next wave is, and, and, and that's a fairly mature technology, but now the next thing is, hey, can we do something else with this? And so, so while there's various upstarts, um, the, the main story here, as we've already mentioned, is DJI. So DJI is, becomes the innovator in this crowd of many other companies had, this, had a similar idea, and there were several products that were coming out. But DJI really had just better design overall and, and, and all this and that. And as we mentioned, we have our Phantom. Where's our Phantom? Here's a Phantom. Okay, so here, here's, here's the, the basic Phantom body, right? And so the idea is, now what we've done, rather than go bigger, 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 we've, we've gone smaller, smaller, smaller. And um, the main thing here is to just take pictures, right? So the main thing here is take pictures. So there's a, there's a, a relatively sophisticated camera for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, pretty sophisticated camera. Now we'd say, now your, your, the phone or the camera on most of your phones is probably better than, the, than this camera, but still, you know, for the time it was, it was pretty good. Um, and the idea was um, rather than have a, a fixed wing aircraft, the emphasis of all these startups was on a multi-rotor. And so the idea was, was to take pictures, hobbyists, um, artists, things like that. So the idea was how can we get a different perspective to take these photos? And so the, the um, multi-rotor platform was decided that, that that's the most efficient thing, right? Uh, or that's the best thing. Um, we're we're going to talk about parts of the drone uh, after, after this intro, so I'll, I'll just pause there. But suffice it to say, all the main components of our modern drone are represented in this, in this DJI thing, that was the very first iteration that came out uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, again, the DJI um, and, and the various models for how to do drones were, were, um, were coming up, and I'm simplifying this uh, greatly, but, but the two extremes, I think, are best represented by, by that, by the DJI, which again is like the Apple, like the iPhone, the, the Mac uh, type of model, closed ecosystem, turnkey, flip it on, boom, go, versus 3DR, which is 3, 3D Robotics. This is the, the group we mentioned before that was um, uh, designed here in California, initially manufactured here in California, and then it, uh, manufactured in Tijuana. And then eventually they couldn't keep up with, uh, with DJI and they folded. Um, 
but this was founded by one of the editors of Wired magazine who was doing all this reporting on technology. He's like, hey, we should probably do something like this. So this is on the other end of the spectrum. So just, just looking between these, these two guys, this is very slick and iPhone-y looking, very smooth, very, very kind of clean lines. This is a little more like, er -y, er -y. this is a little more sort of Lego, um, you know, erector set type of, type of looking thing. Uh, these guys did not come with their own cameras, so you, we had to put our own GoPros on here, which is fine, but, but the point is it was all very kind of plug and play and all kind of very, <clears throat> here's a default platform, you do what you want with it. Um, from our perspective, that was very attractive. We, we've never had anything like this after this company folded. We never had anything close to this, which is we could get into this, the code as well, and we could control some of the architecture for how it would do the sampling or how it would do the flying or whatever, which was really, really great. So those are two models. And while this is great for groups like us, you know, the rando hobbyist, this was too, this was, you know, had to do some coding. This was, this was a bit much or whatever. So, so these guys uh, became the, the clear winner in the market. Um, again, 2011 is when the Navy uh, offered us the, uh, this guy. Um, and, and then at the same time, um, around 2011, 2012, when we were starting into this space, there were starting to be more and more concerns about this technology, as is totally appropriate, as there should be, right? With every new piece of technology, technology is neither good nor, nor bad, it's how we use it, but to simply say that and walk away from the question is baloney, that's irresponsible. Some of these technologies are really quite risky and dangerous and we need to really talk about them with open eyes and, and honest conversations. And one of the most important ones that, that spun up and is still around is this idea of freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of behavior, freedom of speech, all that kind of stuff. So, so uh, if now everybody can just fly this drone around and take a picture of me whenever they want to, is that cool? What if I don't want to have my picture taken, right? Or what if, in the case of DJI, what if they take pictures and, some, and these pictures can be routed to a server in China and then folks in, in Hong Kong and then folks can maybe decide, hey, if I, I want to follow what that person's doing, right? That kind of stuff. Um, or a company here in the U.S. doing the same thing or, or something like that. So, so there's real concern. So, um, so for example, one of the, one of the uh, Ventura County um, I think did this in a really um, responsible way in contrast to Los Angeles County. So this picture is a protest from downtown LA and, and, um, and so what we're seeing here is we're seeing a, a sort of makeshift protest where people are saying, no, um, we don't want this. And so the worry, wa the worry was and is that when we have these very powerful devices in the arms, in the hands of, um, say, law enforcement agencies, maybe they're going to come spy on us, right? Maybe they're going to come look on my own property doing something that maybe is not untoward, but might look untoward, and, you know, that kind of thing. And so LAPD, in their classic LAPD fashion, um, uh, basically was like, hey, we got a bunch of drones now, it's going to be great, right? already to communities that, that have experienced maybe disproportionate amounts of helicopter flights and, and, and policing and this and that. So people are like, hell no. But for the purpose of our class, what's important is to understand the backstory here. The backstory was LAPD did not buy a drone and then say, hey, let's experiment with this. LAPD bought a whole fleet of drones. So it wasn't like, they weren't going from like nowhere to let's try this out, let me put a toe in the water, to let me put an ankle in the water, to let me put my knees into the water. It was like, hey, we got a drone program. And so it was, it was, it was zero to 60, or it was talked about as if it was gonna go from zero to 60, right? Where did they get their drones from? Oh, they got their drones from the Seattle Police Department. Why do they get their drones from the Seattle Police Department? Because the Seattle Police Department said, hey, drones are great, we're gonna buy them all. So they bought a whole bunch of these drones for their police forces, and then the public is like, uh, hell no. So they said, okay, we're gonna back off. Does anybody wanna buy these? And LAPD went, sure. They didn't look at the stories, they didn't look at the news cover, like, oh my gosh, maybe there is an issue with just simply wholesale buying this technology and trying to deploy this technology from the get-go. So, so not only is there the inherent 
challenges and honest discussion we should have. But the LAPD completely ignored the, his the, the last you know, year or two history of the people they're buying it from. And they didn't like, like, why is it so cheap? Maybe, maybe you want to ask why you're getting such a bargain deal on this. So this really starts this era of a bunch of sparks and a bunch of um, uh, uh, should we be doing this or how, or how can we do this appropriately and all that kind of stuff. And what was happening in this era is this technology is so new, everybody was just like, buy the technology and then figure out the policy as opposed to setting up procedures and policies first and then, and then you know, beginning to see how the technology can make us safer or more secure or whatever. Okay, and that happens with us as well. So just, so in the same era, there is a, um, there is a TGI Fridays back, New York or New Jersey? I can't remember one of the, I think, I think New York. Anyway, so somewhere uh, back there. And um, uh, it was one of these areas, like these franchises, you know, a lot of times there are, um, uh, sometimes people just own a restaurant. Sometimes people own like a group of restaurants. So this is a guy that owned several of these, you know, chain restaurants. And it was getting close to Valentine's Day. He's like, oh, we're going to do a Valentine's Day promotion. So what are you going to do? And it's a you know, big kind of, you know, the kind of Olive Garden-y kind of big, big restaurant thing with, you know, large indoor spaces, um, big, big screens for like watching sports and things like that. And so the, the guy gets this idea, we're going to have a kiss cam. Like when you go to like a baseball game or a, a basketball game, is a kiss cam. We're going to do a kiss cam, but we're going to do the kiss cam inside, inside their restaurant. So, okay. So basically they get a DJI Phantom and they turn it on and they, they, they pump the audio feed into the big screen TV in the, in the restaurant. And so, so you, know, they're, you know, they're having, um, unfortunately, it was just like a rando bus boy. It wasn't like a professional pilot or whatever. Uh, like fly over people and they're like, oh, it's Valentine's Day. Oh, give her a kiss. And then they, you know, take a picture from above. Um, but as you might imagine, um, well, you'll get to experience this when we start to fly, uh, probably starting next week. Um, but it, uh, they, they can be a little hard to control at times, right? Especially when you're just getting a feel for it. And, and, and they can be particularly, depending on how you have the control set up, they can be really sensitive or, or not particularly sensitive. And this guy was flying inside. And so he's flying this drone and he goes over this, uh, this table and the guy bumps something. I don't know if he bumps the... the um, fans or the lights or something, bumps it and the drone falls out onto this lady's face. So thankfully she ends up being okay. But the blade, the prop, um, uh, which looks like this, the prop goes, you know, as it's tumbling down, it goes and it hits her right below her cheek, or, or right below her eye and cuts her cheek. So she's okay, but it could have easily blinded her. And while that would be horrible for anybody, she was a photographer. So not only would she have been blinded, that would have like nuked her career as well, right? So it becomes this whole story. So Stephen Colbert talks about it. All the late night talk show hosts start talking about it, like, what's going on, you know, these guys? And, and it becomes sort of a, a huge story. So in the wake of that, everybody starts saying, uh, and she's like, I'm gonna sue. And everybody starts, and, and there's this all of a sudden, whoa, 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 people are gonna start suing? And then we, we were, again, using these technologies. You know, we, we had some of these platforms. We're starting to figure out how to use them for research, starting to figure out how to, how to have classes with you guys with these things. Um, and then this happens. And the C our CSU system says, nope, no one fly these things. No flight. In us, you know, our little baby brand new university starting up, as well as places like Cal Poly Pomona, Cal Poly Slow that have had decades and decades of aeronautical engineering programs that have built these types of things, right? Everybody was grounded, stop, everybody stop. Nobody flies, nobody flies, nobody flies. And this was um, driven by um, fear of lawsuits, A, and B, the FAA. So the FAA looking at this starting to say, like, hey, what's going on? Um, uh, maybe we'll talk more about the, the model airplane story, our, our first time out at Camp Park, because that's a good place to talk about that. But I'll just say that, that um, model airplanes had been, I don't have that in this history. These are um, completely robot, these are completely remotely controlled. So these are, there's no autonomy here. There's no, you, historically, there's no auto stabilization, all these key things that makes this technology great. But they are basically hobbyists. Folks that like to go like do model airplanes and model you know remote control cars and stuff. It, it was that type of technology. 
these devices are flying all over the place, including there's a there's a uh, there's a um, a model airplane uh, uh, runway right next to the U.S. border with Mexico. And I mean, it's these things, you, when you look back now, you're like, wow, that was legit and that was okay. Nobody cared because nobody knew about it. As this starts to get all this attention, as these, as these, you know, this accident in this restaurant back east and these other things, all of a sudden everybody starts paying attention to this technology. And they're like, oh my God, we got to regulate this. This looks scary. This looks, this looks not good. And so, so in our case, the CSU said, N stop, unless you, have, unless you have rules. And so it turns out we created our own rules and we were the first group um, that was allowed to um, go back to using drones. Um, in the CSU, which is the largest public university system in, in, in the country. And then essentially, um, then our our model from here at CSUCI became the template, and now things have evolved, people have changed things, but, but initially everybody had to do at least our standard or better. And so a lot of people just ended up sort of cloning what we did. Um, and, and other universities, community colleges, other places, I, I would consult with different places in other parts of the country and to help them get their drone programs going. And so, so um, essentially, I'll just tell you what it says, but essentially um, our policy basically says that if we're going to do any flying, it has to first be approved, essentially, is, is what it says. So you can't just, can't just randomly grab a drone. So every, every year before graduation, I get phone calls. Hey, so uh, yeah, I'm graduating and I want to fly my drone over, over graduation. So can I do that? And I have to tell them, ah, oh, yeah, dude, well... You get, we have a policy, so you have to submit an application. Not every single flight, but if you want to do this project, you have to you know, submit one the first time you do the project. And it goes to essentially an oversight board. So um, because this is our still policy, it's called unmanned because that's what the original name was way back when. But, but um, it's basically a mixture of administrators, campus administrators, faculty, um, and then... Um, uh, folks from the community. So there's some folks from the community on the board as well to make sure that we're not doing something untoward and we're not doing some weird university project to do whatever. Um, and there's also representatives from, uh, a representative from um, uh, uh, the campus police uh, services on there. So not necessarily a cop, but somebody from public safety is on, on the board as well. And essentially they just say, yeah, that's cool, right? And in most cases. But for the, the rando person that wants to fly their drone over graduation, that would not be allowed, right? Just because of safety and, and, and concerns. And so what, they, what, we, what, what we usually end up saying is, oh, the campus will have their own drone pilot. You can, they are happy to give you photos or you can take photos of your you know, family or whatever with it. And they're like, well, I want to do it myself. So that, that's usually die. But so for example, this class, various research projects we do, we, we go through the unmanned systems board. Um, okay, um, so I just say I just say the lesson there with the, with the history of this technology is don't be like the LAPD, be like us, or be like the Ventura County Sheriff. How the Ventura County Sheriff dealt with this issue again, all in the same era, all in the same time, was they looked at this and they said, "Hey, this technology looks potentially really useful, right?" But you know, I don't know. It, maybe it is, maybe it's not, maybe there's a problem with it. So they said, hey, this is what we want to do. We want to get a unit for search and rescue of people. So not in urban cores or anything, but out in the Los Padres or places like that. And so that's what we want to do. And so they went first to the County Board of Supervisors and they said, hey, we would like to do this, but we just want to make sure that this is above board and that you know, our wider community is supportive of this. So they, you know, they, they had a public hearing, they had proposals, and initially it was like, yes, let's use this only for search and rescue. And then we use it for search and rescue for a while, and then, hey, maybe we can use it with the fire services. And then it sort of slowly spread, which seems to me a much more, I think, a much more responsible use of the technology. So how, how can we do this? And as we're going down the road, we can be figuring out what are the dangerous parts or what are the parts we need to be concerned about, as opposed to whole cloths suddenly converting to some new technology. That's where we usually get in pitfalls whether it's AI or flying robots or whatever. Okay, so, and confronting the issues directly is always the best policy, being really explicit about stuff. Um, uh, other things, we started getting some grants, and so we started building. So this is one of our first 
ROVs, um, and this is uh, uh, essentially a DIY kit that you could build an ROV for about 900 bucks. And this, and this is very, very, uh, uh, you know, DIY. And so the, the camera here, this is an underwater robot now. So this camera here is a backup camera from a minivan because they, they make tons of them and they work really well in low light and they have a very wide angle. So you could actually see what's going on. And this is primarily an educational uh, tool. Um, but but we had, I had, had students use this for capstone, for example, to s s uh, survey uh, marine protected areas and things like that. Um, and we would build them all ourselves and stuff. Uh, we also started doing really, really simple robots. So this is um, a similar thing, um, which just uses thrusters, which we have on our flying robots as well. So something to, to make the liquid move, either air or water, in this case water, make it move one direction or the other, and then provide some level of buoyancy with these um, PVC pipes um, and structure. And so this was uh, these, we do these for um, robotics competitions with, um, you know, K through 12 groups and stuff like that. Uh, we, uh, next, the uh, room that's down over there that's now been converted back to a classroom, but for many years, this was the, the main spot for the Ventura County Office of Ed, of Education. They began years ago at the Camarillo airport, um, a pilot certification program. So if you're in high school and you want to become a pilot, you could take these, these courses and get, you know, eventually become a, a licensed uh, a commercial pilot. Um, but in the process of that, they also teach them aeronautics and stuff. And so they originally started making model airplanes. And then when drones came on the scene, they started doing this stuff. And now this is a much larger part of their curriculum rather than being a pilot. It's about using drones. And so, um, so we became the place where they, um, uh, would do that stuff and, and teach that stuff. Um, and that, that's evolved into maker spaces. Um, and we were bursting the seams in 2015 and then we moved into here. And again, one of the reasons this lab looks the way it did is because of the way I was te we were teaching drones at the time. So, uh, yeah. Um, so how I initially would teach you guys is, and we've abandoned this now, but, but the, the early days, um, we'd start with these very small things like these guys have, right? So uh, still, still quadcopters, but micro, right? Uh, we now consider these toys, right? That, like little teeny tiny things. And we'd fly them around. And because they're so small, they're really susceptible to wind movement. So we would fly them indoors. And so we have this lab, our lab space here set up so that we can move the tables off to the side. So if we were doing that, say today, I'd put everybody you know, in the middle and you guys would, would, would um, fly them up and down. Um, Okay, so then, so then around that same time, as I mentioned before, uh, I touched on this last time, about how the FAA originally uh, clamped down. So, around, uh, so at this, this same era, talking about a decade or so ago, um, there was, uh, the FAA wasn't controlling these things. And then when these accidents started to happen, um, and concern, and, and every random 12-year-old was buying one of these things off Amazon, the FAA said, uh, we know, FAA controls the airspace. So we dictate anything, any flying thing up in, up in the air. Again, that's why DJI is now the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world because the FAA declared these things aircraft. I think that was wrong. I, don't, I think that was a foolish move. We should have classified them as something else. But, but, um, but in, in any event, they did. And, and they said, uh, so then they said, oh, you cannot fly these things, right? Um, and so, uh, like, wait, so, so you're, you're saying they're in an airplane and, they, and, and you have to do this. So then initially, the first phase of regulation was you have only a certified airplane pilot can fly these because these are now classified as a, as a um, flying aircraft, which is ridiculous, right? Completely ridiculous. And it was, it was such a problem that several of us were planning on getting our hot air balloon license because that's cheaper than an airplane license, but that would meet the FAA regulations. But even so, at the time, even with that, whatever, you'd have to get a, a pilot's physical every year. I would have to get a pilot's physical every year because you know, they want to make sure a pilot's not going to have a heart attack when they're flying a 747 across, or whatever across the Atlantic. I mean, it's like completely ridiculous, completely ridiculous. Um, so initially, there was a, uh, the first phase was a thing called a Part 333, license that we could get. Um, and then eventually that would become what you guys now have, which is the part 107 uh, license. 
importantly, I'll say for all this, everybody's worried about this, what you can't do. Um, don't do this, don't do this. There's almost no emphasis on the main thing what, that our class is doing this semester, which is practical experience. All the stuff is where you can go, can't go. Read aeronautical charts, don't read aeronautical charts. There's, there's, there's no practical test. If you wanna fly an airplane, right? Or if we wanna drive a car, yes, of course there's a written test. That's, that's important to know the rules of the road. But there's also, you have to physically get in your car and drive and show somebody that you can park it and you can accelerate and all this. And, and I'm particularly sensitive to this because I'm very upset. I had a traumatic, I had a very traumatic uh, getting my driver's license. Everybody in my school is getting a license and it was my turn and I went up and there's a big airport near where I uh, was going to school. And you get in the car and this big dude gets in the car and says, okay, pull out. And I pull out and he goes, turn right. And I turn right and he goes, turn right, turn right again and driving along this road that parallels this very long runway, like a, whatever it is, a mile or two long runway. And uh, so he goes, okay, pull over. So I pull over, you know, park. He's like, okay. And he goes, back up. And I put the car in reverse and I went back like a car length and I stopped. And he goes, no, back up more. I'm like, oh, okay. So I back up, you know, along the, along the um, curb. So I back up like two, three car lengths and I stop. And he goes, no, no, back up till I tell you stop. I was like, what? I'm like, okay. And so I'm backing up, I'm, you know, paralleling the thing. And then after like 15 seconds, I bump the curb. And he goes, oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. I'm like, okay. He goes, okay, forward, forward. And he goes, right turn. Okay, right turn, right turn. And then all of a sudden, boom, we pull right back in the DMV. Like three minutes after I left the DMV. I'm like, wow. And he goes, okay, great. And he's writing his notes. I'm like, ah. And my friends were like, what percentage did you get? I got 89% of my driver's test or whatever. And I was like, hey, so how'd I do? And he goes, oh, you failed. And I was like, wait, wait, what? And I was like, all nervous, like, oh, huh? And he's like, yeah, you touched the bump the curb is an automatic disqualification. So apparently it was known that this was this guy did, like all day long. He'd just take people out and he'd make them back up until they bumped the curb. And then he'd, I mean, which is kind of an a-hole thing. That's how we said. But, uh, but then, then like I spent, the, and I couldn't take it for six months. So it was like, you know, so every day I'd practice backing up, backing up, backing up. So, so I'm particularly sensitive to the need. One, we should all have this practical training, but also I've been bitten on the butt by people that sort of abuse this stuff. So, so I think the practical training is more important than the rules. The rules are also important. I don't say, I'm not saying we shouldn't have any rules, but, but the first step I think should be that you can safely make the thing move around in an environment in a safe way. And then once you can safely do that, let's make sure you also know the rules of the road. That is not the approach the FAA has taken. Spurred on by these lawsuits and, and this, this concern and this worry, they've, uh, all of those certifications, the, um, the hobbyist one, the, the part 107, all these things are just, you know, can you tell me what the right answer is to this? And so especially in this era, we would go to these trainings with these different platforms and you know, I or my students, you guys, we'd have hundreds of hours of flight experience on with a DJI drone or whatever the whatever the thing was. And the guy doing the training was almost always a guy. The guy doing the training was like had like 20 hours of experience, or whatever. And he's telling us how to do stuff. And a lot of times he would they would f stuff up because the technology was so new. And we would be like, oh, you want me to show you how to do that? Let me let me fix that for you. So it was it was sort of ass backwards in terms of um, stuff. We um, were really, really adamant that we wanted this class that you guys are taking now to exist because we wanted this to be the foundation. So no matter what you did, if you didn't use this technology very much, if you're a hobbyist, whatever, it, like this, this safety, grounding and safety and practical experience, everybody should have that. But, um, but, but most places don't. And then what happened was these schools started spinning up, mostly at airports, um, to basically you know, two, three, four, five day academies where you go and you get the practical experience, but those cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we thought this should be an accessible thing to everybody. Everybody should have access to basic safety training. Um, and so our original approach to this to, for you guys was to start with these very small, teeny tiny units. Actually, the very first thing we do is I, I put you on a flight simulator and you guys would, would, would sort of play a game with the sort of drone technology. 
uh, same controls that we would use. And then we would move to these little teeny flying things, and then we move to more intermediary things, and then we'd go to these guys. And invariably, you guys would always be super angry with me, because by the time you got to these, you're like, Dr. Ray, these things are so easy to fly. Like all those other things you had us fly were much harder. And it was like, well, that was the point. I wanted you to make sure you could fly even the hardest stuff first. But it's, this stuff has just gotten so ubiquitous and so good that, that sort of, that, that original um, philosophy seems, you know, we don't really need to do that uh, these days because uh, the stability controls have gotten so good. Um, and, and we've, yeah, done with stuff with all the people all over the place. Okay, let me show you some of the examples of the kinds of things we can do with this technology. Um, again, the way it works on our campus is you guys take this class, um, and because the only FAA thing for, for, for you all is the commercial, the part 107, that's what we require. If you guys want to work on our research projects, that's what we require. Um, and so there should be something else, but there isn't. I know we're not trying to make, in a class or a research project, we're not trying to make money. We're just trying to collect data for an agency or to solve a problem, but that's the only standard. So we require, um, so in our class, because you guys are in the class, <clears throat> You guys can pick up, you know, over, obviously over the next, you know, several months, we'll be flying these things around, we'll be doing stuff, that's cool. Once we're done with the class, um, if you guys, we, I'd love to have all of you guys trained and all of you guys be able to help on some of our research projects and things, but um, uh, to use those, to be involved with that, our safety protocols say that you all have the Part 107. And so all of our research pilots are Part 107 certified. Um, uh, but if you, if you get that, you can start to do some of this kind of stuff. Um, so this is one of our classes in the Cook Islands. I told you that one story about, um, about Paul, uh, who's this guy, um, with the, with the um, Inspire strapped to his back that it thought it was falling out of the air and turned on and everything. I have more stories I could tell you. Um, this is some of our very early, uh, this looks very pixelated, but very early mapping efforts. Um, in this case, looking at this coastal forest. Um, uh, so, so we do a lot of development of technology or a lot of trying out of different cameras, a lot of trying out of this thing, that thing. And that's a real important uh, part of it is, is giving you all, um, people that don't have years and years of experience, some of these technologies and platforms and seeing if you can use them. So if you can use them, that's usually an indication that the technology is pretty solid. Whenever we go places with these things, we always have to bring repair kits because things always break and, and whatever. So this is one of our mobile repair labs in the Pacific. Um, a lot of what we'll do, and we'll do this later in the semester once we get more comfortable, is create what we call structure from motion. So we create a 3D representation of whatever the thing is, the sea cliff or the beach or the what, what have you, um, by flying these, these picture, these, the, this drone over, taking many, many pictures and then stitching those those photos together to create um, a three-dimensional surface of, of whatever it is we're trying to map. Um, you can use them to, quant to measure critters. So in this case, this is an underwater ROV counting fish inside and outside in a marine protected area. We can also use these things to, to monitor wildlife, um, all that kind of good stuff, all, all fun projects. Um, we've used them in, the, in emergency contexts in the wake, for example, of the refugio oil spill. Um, so we uh, took some of our, uh, so again, these were built for education purposes, right? These little cheap DIY drones. We threw them on a boat with a uh, um, Santa Barbara uh, channel keeper and we went out and we were looking to see if there was oil deposition um, in areas away from the immediate um, spill on, on the refugio coast. Um, and we happily did not see much, um, which was later confirmed, but, but it was like, we were like the first folks out there to sort of check, and, and this technology allows you to do this. this. This nice portable mobile technology gives us the flexibility to adapt when we do have a natural disaster. Um, uh, we also do a fair amount of uh, uh, trying to see if we can, so, so one thing here is, so that, that first one is getting out there fast, right? So it's great that it can be a, a quickly deployed technology. The other thing this can do is this can give us um, uh, uh, insights that we either can't get otherwise or would be more costly to get uh, or more problematic. So in this case, um, so we're uh, the first group to be given a, a federal permit to fly over um, these endangered shorebirds. And so these are little snowy plover chicks out at, out at Ormond. And, um, and so we're, uh, they, they're, 
you can see them here on the left, if you haven't seen them in real life, probably many of you have seen them in real life, but, but they blend in really well with the sand, right? And they can be really, even when you're near them, they can be hard to see, um, but especially when you're farther away. And um, what tends to happen is when we go to monitor them, they're hard to see. And so, uh, for example, one of the things that, that traditionally researchers do when we find a nest is they'll take a popsicle stick and they'll put a popsicle stick near there that's like number 10, number 15, number whatever, right? And they back off. So then in the future, they can monitor them from farther away with binoculars. But just the fact that we walk up to them a lot of times will attract predators to these guys. So particularly crows um, and corvids. Um, and so, so if we go near them and they move a little bit, um, that in and of itself, our doing the physical monitoring could potentially put these guys in danger, right? Or it might make the parents bail on them or something. So, so this is actually a, a technology that we can um, not only use to, to be uh, more efficient, et cetera, but maybe even minimize our impact on the resource when we're doing the monitoring. And so this was several years to just show that, that um, uh, a couple things. But one, you see that these guys are, that the, the chicks are, are also um, uh, associated with human disturbance. So they're either right in the tire tracks where the, um, you know, police or, or um, lifeguards drive or where people step, right? So, so, so that's, that's of note because particularly with the, the, tr the trash, because the cops you, and, and the people driving on the beach usually drive in the same path. So if these guys are starting to nest there, that's, that's a problem. Um, but anyway, so we can use the technology for that kind of stuff. Um, and then we can use it for, is this, I can't remember, this is a video. So this is uh, using, um, so this is a burning seep in the wake of the Thomas uh, fire. This is many, many, this is like almost a year after the Thomas fire. But this is still an oil seep that caught fire because of the um, wildfire. And so this is, these are these guys were actually taking some um, uh, uh, canister, uh, 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 air, like high resolution air samples. And, um, and so we both used the drones to find the burning seeps but, and measure how big they were, but also to monitor if these guys were being uh, safe and, and if they needed help and, and things of that nature. Um, and uh, we also, uh, probably most famously, some of you all have helped us with this um, already, but we also uh, have used them to improve the quality of data that we have relative to, to beforehand. So in this case, this is in the Maui Channel. This is our work uh, uh, off of Lahaina. And so um, Dr. Rachel Cartwright, who um, has retired from the university, but we still work with her all the time. She's, uh, she's an emeritus with us. Um, so she, uh, she started this nonprofit in the 90s, basically looking at mother-calf relationships. And so before this, before we started using drones there, the idea was to go out in a boat and look with binoculars and you kind of say, ah, oh, it's a mom, it's a baby. Okay, cool. And that one looks kind of big and that one's kind of, and it was sort of estimated behavioral stuff. Now, we still do that, but now we can fly over and then because we have the drone at a known height and we know the, you know, the height of the drone and, the si and, and, and all this and that, we can actually get very detailed morphometrics of the mom, of, 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 of all the whales. But when they come right to the surface, we can get their, their girth, their length. Okay, anyway, so, so basically we get the morphometrics of, of the whales and we can learn a lot of things. So for example, when mom comes in and she's pregnant, She's really, has a big girth, right? She's really wide. And then when she gives birth, she gets thinner, but she still has, has some, you know, some thickness to her. And then she starts nursing her baby. And so as she's burning her fat reserves, convert it. And, and so while these humpbacks are in Maui, they're not feeding. So they're, it's, they only feed up in the, up in the Alaska feeding grounds. So, so basically just consuming her energy reserve. So burning that fat, converting that fat into milk for, the, for her baby. And so you can get a good estimate of, hey, is this mom getting ready to, is it about time for her to bail? Is she getting close to bailing because she's getting thinner, 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 thinner? So that kind of insight, um, we just didn't have before this stuff. So, so this stuff can be rapid, this stuff can be cost effective, and this stuff can either help us be more safe um, data collectors or give us insights and sets of data that, that is novel that we've not uh, used before. And the same thing. So this was, this, was, um, this was a fun one. In the Cook Islands, we built a, a, a certain um, uh, colored uh, light um, into our ROV and drove it across the reefs. I was still, we, we sort of paused on this. I would love to get back to this research. It's, it's really interesting. But we had our drone that we designed here. We sent the designs to this marine lab in southern England, 
uh, uh, this guy over here uh, that was doing his uh, graduate work on this stuff. And we and a specific wavelength of light. And then we added a filter on our, um, on our in front of our camera. And so we could excite certain um, uh, of the pigments in the photosynthetic zooxanthellae inside the coral. And so when you looked at stuff, you'd see all this, you could see them in different lights. And so we think this could be a really useful way for doing biodiversity surveys on coral reefs using things in addition to just regular spectrum light. But, but it was a, a cool example of uh, partnering with other organizations with this technology as well. Um, yeah. So where are we now? Okay, so where are we now? So, we're, so um, we'll wrap up this sort of introduction to this stuff to say that, um, uh, uh, as we mentioned before, DJI is the big giant player. DJI has done, you know, most of this, you know, they, they, they're the massive behemoth here. The cheapest one, the, the most turnkey, all that kind of good stuff. But as we mentioned before, uh, there are some concerns now with DJI. Um, being a uh, Chinese-owned company and the sort of authoritarian regime and control structures that exist in China. Um, uh, and so some of our sensitive areas, like Department of Defense lands, et cetera, have decided that they do not want to have DJI products flown over their property or, or, or potentially imaging their personnel or something like that. So that's um, uh, created what's called a blue list or, or blue SAS. Um, and that is a list of approved drones that could be used for fed on federal property, on federal land, stuff like that. And so that's, that's really led to now a, a, a growth in um, the uh, sort of domestic market. So, so our, our American um, drone manufacturers were pretty much put out of business by and large by, the, by DJI because they're just so good and they're so efficient and it was hard to compete. And so most of our, uh, and it's still the case, but, but, but the, the, the legacy, I say legacy as if they've been here forever, but, but the drone companies that started say a decade or so ago that still exist, they're, doing, they're mostly highly specialized. So they're in Hollywood, they're making very special uh, you know, camera carrying drones, or they're in an agricultural setting making very specialized drones for you know, precisely deploying herbicides or you know, something of like that nature, very, very specialized. Um, this blue list though is, is helping there to be those, those surviving companies to be more competitive and to have more offerings and more options. So there's more options all the time. Just like there's more options um, uh, with the flying platform, there's also more options to deal with the data. And so there's also a whole constellation of apps and, and platforms to help you collect data, help you manage risk, all this kind of stuff. And while we don't use a huge number of those, we use a lot of the mapping things. But if you guys are thinking about a business, it's now super turnkey. You can get, your, you can get insurance on demand. So rather than buy, you know, if, if you wanted to start your own drone consulting business, you probably want to have your own you know, insurance thing. But, but as you guys are starting up or maybe you want to help a friend do something or consulting, whatever, you can now buy drone insurance by the hour. So, if, so rather than pay like hundreds hundreds of dollars a year, maybe you just pay 30 bucks for this project, right? Because you're going to want to help out your cousin, but you want to make sure if something crashes, you don't, you're not going to be in trouble. So all these things have really proliferated. So just like the platforms are proliferated now, the software and the control uh, 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 universe of, of technologies has also expanded and gotten um, uh, quite sophisticated. Um, okay, uh, the last thing I'll say is, uh, we won't, we're probably not going to get this to today, but one thing we're going to do also is, um, we, we did for uh, several years, then the pandemic kind of slowed us down here, but we're also, um, I think it's very important for you all to, to understand the cultural and the social context of these things so you can use them prof professionally and, and efficiently and safely. And so um, that includes uh, you know, getting a sense of, of how, what the public thinks about these things. And so for example, here's an example from uh, our 2014 class where um, we're gonna, we're, you guys are going to do some uh, surveying of the general public to see what they think about this technology. Is this good, bad, what's going on? And um, what, we, what we've seen uh, definitely in the early years, which is, is pretty, was pretty consistent more or less from year to year to year, um, a lot of people are not sure, are neutral about drones. 
well, well, okay, we'll see if this is still the case, but especially early on in the early 2000s to like 20 teens, you know, kind of thing. Um, a lot of people were, were unsure or were kind of in the middle, like, eh, maybe good, maybe bad, I don't know, kind of neutral. Or they had no idea, like, I, I don't know about this, I'm not sure. So when you add that unsure to that neutral, you get the vast majority of people. So most people are not pro drones or anti drones. They're, they're somewhere else, right? They're, they're kind of just somewhere. Um, they could be convinced that these are very bad things or these are very helpful things, right? But they've not picked a camp. Of the folks that have picked a camp, almost always we found that the negative views dominated the positive views. So, so, so it's usually on the order of about two to one. That, that again, let's say it again, the vast majority of people, like you know, you know, two thirds ish or so of the population. Are, are convincible, right? And this sort of mirrors a lot of our resource management discussions in general, right? A lot of people don't have time to figure out the details. They don't know about this. I'm not sure. They're, you know, they're open to hearing arguments about if we should do this activity or not do this activity. But what we hear about is all the people that have very strong opinions. And in the case of drone stuff, um, there is people that did have opinion were you know, two to one likely to have a bad opinion of them. And so, it's important for you guys to understand that. So when you're going out to use this technology to help monitor an endangered bird or something like that, we have to be cognizant of that. One, the vast majority of people need to be educated. So the vast majority of people don't know what's going on, right? A. B, when if somebody says something about that, they're probably going to have a negative view. And that's, that's cool and that, that's totally fine. But um, you should sort of be aware of that, right? And, and be respectful and stuff, as opposed to walking in very arrogant, just, oh, I'm mopping the birds here, bastard. You know, like that, that's not, that would not be helpful in this context where people are either ignorant or often um, negative on the technology. So, so we'll do some of that so you guys will get your own sense of how the public uh, thinks about this stuff.